Hello. Good evening. Hello. Ah, it's amazing. You're on the other side of the earth. That's right. <laughs> I think, but this this type of distances don't impress you. I think. <laughs> no, that's true. But I'm always impressed. <laughs> Still, <laughs> one thing is: Do you think you could uh, turn the volume a little bit up? Because I already have it at the maximum. Yeah. Um, is it better now? Uh, a little bit higher. I cannot do much better. I think uh, usually it's a good system. So I. Uh, yeah, I forgot did last try, time. Did, I, you try, did you try to? Um, maybe it's okay. Last time I tried. Like last time I brought an extra speaker along, but I forgot it this time. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm using that kind of system, which is very, very good. I mean. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Good, good, good. So, so you're having a you're having a, a dinner, right? Or is it just yeah, the way dinner? yeah the way it works. You know, I was a fellow in Trinity uh, for ten years or so. And about six years ago, I set up Trinity in Japan here. And uh, we are meeting about once a month. And uh, here, all our Trinity people, except here, uh, uh, our friend here, you can see here, who, hello. Yeah, who, hello. <laughs> hello, everybody. And she will come to Switzerland tomorrow. And she uh, does the um, uh, uh, global strategy for one of the biggest uh, pharmaceutical companies here. Um, oh, okay. So uh, I asked her also as a guest along tonight. And so we are all so very, very impressed by your Nobel Prize. Congratulations. And Thank you. <laughs> uh, you found the first uh, planet outside our solar system and everything was different than it was uh, expected. Uh, like people were thinking all the other uh, solar systems would look, uh, planetary systems would look similar to ours because nobody had seen any other except for you. So everything was completely different. So uh, we are very much looking forward to hearing all these surprises from you. Yeah, well, actually, this was not an easy way at, at the beginning because um, well, no, we know that a lot of this planet orbiting other star, uh, they are kind of different mm -hmm. uh, for the vast majority uh, compared to the planet of our own solar system. And uh, when we found this very extreme what object that we call a hot Jupiter, mm -hmm. well, essentially, nobody believed us. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we, it, it was so awkward. Um, it came from nowhere. Mm -hmm. People have been looking for planet for quite hundred years. I mean, this is, was a kind of a old topic of astronomies and people trying to find planets and they were always very optimistic. There has been a lot of false claim in the thirties, mm -hmm. uh, then in the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. So there has been plenty and tea of, of people believing that they would have found a planet, but actually they were just finding their own mm -hmm. um, faulty equipments essentially. And, uh, when we announced that, people were very skeptical because it was well, first, it was one of the many announcements of planets. I think you said it could have been a shadow on the surface of the sun or, or some other or magnetic well, anomalies. Or... Well, it could have been many things, but, but the problem that people had at that time is it didn't fit at all into the, uh, the formation mechanism that yes. people had patiently built on the base on the solar systems. And they had yes. good reasons for that. They had spent billions of USD or whatever you want, unit you want to count to send probes in the in all the places, all the planets of the solar system, and they have yes. passionately built a kind of a mind frame for mm -hmm. the system would form. Mm -hmm. That was pretty good and it's still valid for the solar mm -hmm. system. Uh -huh. But this framework uh, could not be applicable to the okay. planet that we were claiming. And, and it took us quite a lot of time to convince the community and people that say, oh, you're not seeing the planet, you're seeing these, the atmosphere of the star. That was after your nature paper was published. Was and we, yeah, I mean, all this, all this, we had rejected it and in the paper. And actually, if you look at the paper, uh, essentially the, the, the discovery itself is only a small part of it. The rest of the discussions is how can we exclude all the other possibilities? And we are in this kind of a interesting situation at the end of the paper, we're saying, oh, we're sorry, guys, we are not able to explain that 
uh, in other way yes, than yes. by saying there must be a planet there. And we're fully aware this planet is not what you expect, but that's what it is. And actually it was just the beginning of an avalanche of planets that all were different. And, and then uh, 4,000, I think, 25 now. years later. Now there are 4,000, is that right? Or... Well, I, frankly, I don't count, it doesn't matter. We yeah. know that uh, essentially every star has almost a planet. Actually, the statistics right now is more than half of the star have planet the way we're finding. So the planets yes. are big, massive and close to the stars. Okay. And there is maybe 30% of the star we don't know. But I do think that yeah. there are planets as well on these systems because planetary formation seems to be extremely easy uh, okay. and happening in all cases. Yeah. Um, no, the question is, what are we talking about? What kind of planet? And, and then if you go a little bit further, is which one you may expect to find possible uh, evolution of life on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, one thing uh, from your papers I saw is that our planetary system is more like an exception than the rule. Uh, is that true or is it biased by the measure, way you measure it? Yes and no. Um, uh, first, we, are, we cannot really detect um, let's say a solar system equivalent right now. Yes, we yes. can detect Jupiter. We yes. have found some Jupiter. There's not that many. I mean, Jupiter where they are. It means really oh. at five AU. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 on a kind of circular orbit. There's not that many, but there's a few yes. percent of them that yes. uh, have been identified. Now, um, but that's true that our system. I mean, it's not unique. This is far too much. I think anybody is saying that's unique, but there's something that we are claiming, which is not a common system. Okay. And the reason why it's not common is just by the opposite argument. We know that more than half of the star, they have planets, the one we're finding, and these planets yes. are different. So yes. if more than half of them are different, it yes. means that we are not common. We are in a little bit special, no, whole special, Okay. Uh, it's up to be found. Uh, are yeah, we talking yeah. about 10%, 1%, 20%? Yeah. It's not yeah. very clear. But this is not, I mean, the, this common assumption uh -huh. that all the systems looks like the solar systems, uh -huh. we know right now it's wrong. Yes. And, yes. and then you can ask yourself, do we need something special in the yes. systems to prevent the system to end up like all the planets we're finding yes, and to yes. be like our own system? So that's an interesting question. And there's a lot, lot of ongoing work along this, okay. uh, trying to find um, new elements along this way. Okay. It's a completely, I mean, look, this is an exploration science. We're back into 19th century, essentially, when people are trying to understand the oceans. People yes, were, yes, were yes. sending a lot of ships and trying to understand the oceans, the, yes, the yes. structure of the geophysics and the plate tectonic, all this. And yes, it was yes. all new at that time. And there are people trying to understand this. Well, yes. we're doing exactly the same. So we are absolutely driven by uh, explorations, by experimental driven. And every time we do something, we surprise. And yeah. we realize that by looking to only a single system, which are own yes. systems, you don't get the whole story. And when I give public talks, I used to say, I used to use this kind of image. I say, look, you are you have in your garden maybe one or two flowers because you like some, you like the roses, and it's yes. fine, you have plenty of roses everywhere. And then the next day you go to uh, another place, not yeah. at the same location, it's completely different. Yeah. Uh, and then you realize there is completely different kind of vegetations. And you say, oh my God, uh, I thought the world was made of roses only. Well, actually not. Roses yeah. is part of it, but that's not all of it. So, so it's exactly the situation we're having. I think it's quite fascinating because it opened the, the brain, it yes. opened the perspective of how yes. we fit, and it helps us to understand that we are in a way, just one amongst many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where are you doing your experiments now? I mean, the, the experiment where you got the Nobel Prize for this in 1995 paper, that you did in, in France. But I've seen there are many, many satellite, uh, no, yeah, satellite missions now from NASA and so on, where people observe from the space where you have better conditions probably because yeah. you have less well, I think atmospheric system. <laughs> The field have completely changed. When we did our experiment, uh, we were completely alone. I mean, essentially, I was alone here, and we had an, nobody would care about what we were doing. Yeah, it yeah. was seen as useless, and and it was great fun for me as a PhD student because I can do whatever I wanted. It yeah, was yeah. A kind of a gift, 
So I could do what I wanted. I could just be very creative. And I think I've been very creative here. Uh, yeah. Michel trusts me a lot, my PhD supervisor. So we just we built it. Yeah, you wrote he went with, to Hawaii on sabbatical and you had. Yeah, the, well, that was also an interesting bit because the fact he went away gave me a lot of responsibility and pressure as well. And I always ask myself if Michel would have stayed, maybe we would have missed the planet. So the fact I was so much in charge of it, so much feeling responsible for it. And since I essentially built all the software and the whole program, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to deliver something. And I worked like a crazy. I mean, I was really yeah. obsessive at that time. And that certainly helped. Uh, it may not be all the whole story, but it helped definitely. Yeah. So, so at that time, it was completely isolated experiment. And, and nobody believed to that. No, right now it has completely changed. Because you know, the field is dragging more than maybe you know, 5,000 people working on this field. And uh, we are flying satellite. And no rare. there is a test satellite, the KEOPS satellite. So I'm part of this KEOPS mission directly yes, involved yes, in yes. the building and, and the launch. There will be uh, later, hopefully, the, the successful launch of James Webb Space Telescopes. Uh, that is already on in the pipeline since quite a lot of time that we should be able to do great measurements of atmosphere of planet. There will be Plato, there will be Ariel. We're talking about the next generation of space telescope like LUVO. I think right now this field is driving major investments. The biggest telescope in the world have equipment specific for exoplanet. And the one I know is the extremely large telescope in Chile being built yeah. today. The mirror is 40 meter diameter. So it's huge. How, and there's a couple the, of how big was 40, the yeah, 40, 40, which is just, just huge. Okay. And Chile then there's is, equipment how behind. Was in France? Uh, how big was the mirror in France where you did your first experiments? Oh, it was a kind of an oldish telescope uh -huh. built by the Brits a group person oh. company in the 60s on the 50s okay. and uh, the telescope was from the 50s yeah. so, so the telescope was two meter diameter uh, two that meter. was enough to get the flux no yeah, yeah. if you so want to do direct perfect. imaging if you want to see the planet you need yeah. much bigger mirror. Uh, and how much of this uh, is driven by the search for life and how much is driven for by you know interest in planets Okay, so the search for life is a kind of interesting topic because that's something I've started to get interested a couple of years ago. Yeah, I've um, seen you, you said that you want to learn more about biology. We have the expert here. Yeah, well, I'm learning a lot. Um, yeah, there's a lot of activities in these days. And I think there is a revolution which is bubbling right now. Uh -huh. And uh, well, the, the situation is the following. I think the, the, the usual life in the universe was dealt with uh, what's called exobiology. Uh -huh. That was created by NASA um, in the uh -huh. 60s to respond to the uh, first mission to Mars. You know, remember uh -huh. this Viking mission to Mars? Everybody was yes. extremely excited. They would find life, and it was an absolute disaster uh -huh. because they forgot that UV flux doesn't really uh -huh. doesn't do good for life, and the U and Mars is bathed by UV flux, uh -huh. and it kills everything. Yeah. So um, the Viking was a disaster in that uh -huh. respect. And then the exobiology survived this and kept working on what's called extremophile and mm -hmm. trying to look at a very extreme and bizarre, um, um, I mean, living, um, I mean, species that on extreme conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, frankly, we have not made much progress into life in the universe since uh, essentially mm -hmm. these early days on the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, up to recently. Uh, because recently, um, what happened is in the meantime, we have seen this massive developments of molecular biology. And we have seen also this massive developments of what's called computational chemistry. So people, chemists, doesn't need lab to do chemistry right now. They need big computers. And they are running network, chemistry network. And they do a completely another kind of chemistry, which is instead of doing A plus B makes C, they're uh -huh. doing a zillions of reactions at the same time. And the whole network is driving to something that becomes interesting. So mm -hmm. on this basis, um, about five years ago, there has been the development of a couple of successful first model that try to predict how you can start from very, very basic ingredients, like basic element you have mm -hmm. on the planet uh -huh. to build up the, uh, the building blocks of life. Oh, okay. well, you start with the amino acids. That's uh -huh. something interesting. Then we have these 20 amino acids. Why 20? Why these ones? I mean, you can ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Some of them, a few of them are byproduct of life, but, but, but at the origin, they must be from somewhere. And, and the question is, how do you do that? And, and the first network uh, producing this amino acid from, from, from first principle started to appear in the, in the literature in, in 2015, 2016. Uh -huh. And they were connected to the nature of. No, it's frozen. 
of the seeds and planets and started yeah. to measure directly some of these ingredients, people started to think about, oh, maybe we can try to connect the dots. And instead of moving from the biology to the astronomy, we realized we should move from the astronomy to the geophysics to mm -hmm. understand the condition at the surface of the atmosphere, the oceans and all this, mm -hmm. and the, also the dialogue between the ocean atmosphere and the, mm -hmm. and, the, and the surface. And from the geophysics to the molecular biology, to set up the reactions in molecular biology reaction that may lead at the end to something that would become a line. Mm -hmm. And that is going on. Actually, there has a couple of couples of progress has been made. Uh -huh. uh, into this happened in the last couple of years, which when astronomers started to learn uh, chemistry and chemists started to learn what the astronomers would be doing. And I have an anecdote for that. I, I did, um, I, at Cambridge, I'm working with uh, one, uh, one of the, um, well, one of the lab doing molecular biology, they do, uh, they, they don't really do fundamental researches, but there is somebody there, which is really extraordinary, which is uh -huh. John Sutherman, who uh -huh. has been uh, at, at the beginning uh, of this origin of life uh, chemistry. Okay. And if he's about to be successful later on, I would predict that he may be in the road to get a Nobel Prize as well, for okay. what he did already. And, uh, and John is the first one that came up with a set of reactions that would mm -hmm. explain the 20 amino acid by mm -hmm. first principle. Mm -hmm. But he needed something that is energy because uh -huh. you don't assume anymore. That... Yes. Then the respect, um, you don't expect bringing the energy from the atmosphere like was the original experiment in the sixties when you get a lot of energy and use this. Uh -huh. this... To drive the electron it's around and to make the, the chemistry energy. happening. It's uh -huh. just using the flux from the flux, the flux from, from the photons. Uh -huh. Is it okay? There's some problem. It's with... using the photons, the UV flux of the photons to produce the energy. And I asked him, oh, if you're if you're right, if your chemistry is right, it means the, the lamp you should be using is the sun. And he said, Yeah, you're right. And I, and I asked him, Did you try? And he said, we have no idea. We're using a UV lamp that every chemist is using. We have no idea whether the amount of flux which is needed to produce this reaction is good enough. Okay. And then we started the collaborations. Uh -huh. And then I said, okay, I'm going to build an equipment for you that is making the sun. I'm going to calibrate your data. I'm going to go to your lab. I'm trying to do proper measurements to know exactly how you can scale it up in terms of flux. And we're going to build a new equipment and so on and so on. Uh -huh. And we write our first paper together demonstrating that it works. I think the flux is the right, is a possible source of this energy early on that can produce yeah. the chemistry. Uh -huh. and, uh, and when the paper was we were writing the paper, uh -huh. I said, okay, no, we have to uh, 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 get an estimate of the error bars. And he looked at me, I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, error bars. We never use error bars in molecular <laughs> biology. <laughs> error bars, we don't use it. So this is really a, the, the challenge of this field. Is, oh, yeah. is we are at the interface between different different people and different education. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and one hand, we have the physicists that are very highly mathematical. I mean, that's a like fantastic thing in this. that you can do all of these things together. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's the whole idea. And then and then we're trying to just get this um, together right now and to build up some kind of coherent, uh, coherent uh, I think, uh, new field, which is putting together all these people. So I think the life stuff is really of my interest. And, and, and I know there are some development in Switzerland as well into this direction, because there are a lot of people um, that have this molecular biology background that are interested by this kind of fundamental topic. Behind, I think there is big stuff because there is maybe a completely new uh, chemistry of life that people are going to find. Let's imagine you can make life in the lab. This is different from the life we're having. The potential as a medicine is huge. I think we may be at the kind of a, um, a, a very interesting breakthrough level right now, where we may be starting a comp complete new chemistry, a biochemistry, which is by, by understanding the origin of life on Earth, we may be able to do any kind of life we can think about yeah. and by playing with the chemistry. And that's why this topic starts interesting, um, um, I mean, sponsors and, 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 uh, and big universities right now, because they realize there is maybe something. That how how would you connect that up with your work uh, on different planets? I mean, you would well, look for the spectrum uh, in the uh, spectral indications of these. There is many ways. There is many ways to do that. Mm -hmm. When you do this kind of chemistry, you mm -hmm. need to know where you're starting, and you need to know the conditions. You need to uh -huh. do what we call a dirt lab. So it's yes. not a clean lab that the wet lab that the uh, that the chemists are using. You yes. need 
the earth or, or pound or lake or bottom of lake yes. or uh, any special surfaces to do that. Well, I think astronomy can measure that. Astronomy can provide the mechanisms to build up the planet and to demonstrate what is the nature of this planet. We can measure the surface of the planet. We can measure yes. the composition of the planet. We can measure the composition of the atmosphere. Yes. Some parameters like pressure, temperature on the atmosphere. Yes, yes, yes. And we can rely on geophysical model from the geophysicist to understand the way the atmosphere and the, the internal structure of the planet is going to respond to that. So we can provide this kind of background level of information okay, and we can yeah. look for some specific uh, signature of life. So there is a lot of debate right now what we should be looking at. Um, uh, um, I mean, we have, you have seen the phosphine story, I mean, a couple of yes. weeks ago in, in yeah. Venus. It's one of the many examples, but phosphine is not the only one. I mean, people were talking about oxygen early on, nitrogen, so combining together. But yeah. there may be plenty of other ways to look for this. Um, uh, in the meantime, we will be looking for life on Mars. And Mars is very likely to have hosted life. We're going to bring back sample uh, uh, for Mars we may be looking in more detail into Venus. Maybe there is something we left in Venus. Venus, one billion years ago, was like the Earth. Yeah, so yeah. It was a green planet, very likely. Yeah, so yeah. if the alien would have looked at a planet, would have been able to make a picture, they would have seen two blue planets, which is Earth and Venus at that time. But life would uh, be underneath the surface, or you think that would be on the surface? Or, or what kind well, of... Well, the bacteria? understanding right now is... Oh. Right. So the only, the only common understanding of the origin of life is you need liquid water. Uh -huh. So everybody agrees on this principle. You yeah. need liquid water. Yeah. No, you can have liquid water in many different conditions. You can have yeah. it in kind of uh, the atmosphere, in yes, a layer yes. and clouds. You yes. can have it on pond and river and lake, or yes. you can have it on the bottom of the ocean. So any of these locations potentially would fit the minimum criteria that everybody agree we need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, concerning uh, the present, the, the 2020 Nobel Prize, this kind of switching the topic now a, a bit. Uh, in a way, the work you are doing, uh, can you explain most of it with Newton's mechanics? Uh, yeah. In a way, and well, there's, there's, and there's a couple of things I can say yes. about this, this Nobel Prize. Well, the first thing there is something interesting is if you look back in the last six years, there has been Half of them, half of the Nobel Prize in physics are given to astrophysicists. Yeah, that's, and that's not just by mistake. It's not because we need to be better, it's not the case. It's just it's completely because yeah. astrophysics has experienced a revolution in the last 30 years. Yes, and yes, uh, yes. it was a silent revolution. I mean, it's the same revolution that happened yes. in the 50s for the particle physics. Yes, yes, yes. We are using new equipment. Mm -hmm. A lot of them is directly inherited from the military developments, uh -huh. like all these infrared cameras, all this. And astronomy has become one of the core field in physics. So that's why you see astronomy being developed and teach in any big university right now, because it is a core yeah, physics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the best lab in the world is the universe, because you find everything you need. You find the highest mass, the highest vacuum, the coldest uh, places, the hottest places, the highest pressure, the least pressure, all the parameters, time, space, pressure, matter, uh, the origin of the matter. When you look at the, uh, at the structure of the matter, of the early sign of the beginning of the origin of the, of the universe, everything is in the universe. So physicists has become, by the time, more and more interested about astronomy as a lab. And that's what is happening with the physics Nobel Prize. I think this is all the result that you find when you use the universe as a lab. <laughs> this is the first thing. Well, no, the other one is uh, this black hole. It's something that was predicted a long time ago. So, so there's no surprise on the fact they exist. But what has been made more recently is brand new technology has been used to first measure the mass directly. Uh -huh. And they're using just the Newton law in a way, just okay. modified because of the speed of, the, of, of this particle going around. But, but that what Gensel did, he just measure the black hole, the, the, the motions of, of, of stars around the black hole. And from that, just use like us, you uh -huh. get the mass, not in this case of the particle, but the mass of the central black hole. And then the new equipment to imaging 
uh, was was uh, was was used uh, essentially with the techniques that you combine you correct from the all the defect on the mirror and all the atmospheric uh, um, I mean perturbations to build a sharp image using the biggest telescope on the ground. Mm -hmm. The biggest you are, the more accurate you get. HST is not big enough, is in space, but it's not big enough to do that. You need really uh, 10 meter size telescopes. Mm -hmm. And when you do correctly, and, and you correct this effect on the 10 meter, 10 meter size telescopes, mm -hmm. you can see a black holes. And that's the reason why I think we have this fantastic image right now of black holes, and we know the mass, and we have this beautiful theory of the formation of the black hole. And that's, this, this is the reason why there has been these three recipients, the three uh, um, uh, Nobel uh, laureates, I mean, awarded, is because I think this is really the combinations of the theory that was uh, directly out of the Einstein equations, and then, oh. and then the, the, the experimental uh, achievements uh -huh. to first get the mass and to get the picture. Uh -huh. Uh, my, one question to you is, uh, uh, in your work, where you look at the, uh, the uh, planets, uh, uh, is your, are your results affected by uh, the black mass and black, uh, black energy? Uh, no, we, we don't see that. Um, uh, because the dark energy... The, 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 I mean the, the dark, dark energy. Dark matter, yeah. dark energy. No, the dark energy. Okay, the dark energy is a cosmological term that that has, that is added to the uh, to the formulation. That's uh, when you solve the equation of Einstein. There is a constant. Yes, yes, yes. When you solve integral when you, uh, integral uh, equations, um, uh, when you, you go the reverse way, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there is a constant that is left, and that this is a famous constant that Einstein didn't like. Yes, yes, yes. And this is where it comes from. So it was predicted in a way there is a term. So we don't know what it is in terms yes. of physics. But we know the middle of the that is possible. Uh, and then that is exactly what it is. So it's only valid at the scale of the universe. You don't see it on the scale. scale. No, um, no, what you're talking about then is the dark matter. So dark matter is something that you sense to be part of the baryonic matter because you would see it. It has to be something else. So people have been talking about neutrinos. I've been talking about a lot of elements here that can explain this. Um, you only see when you have a big size, because to sense it, you have to get significant amount of, of distances to see it. Mm -hmm. So the distance we're talking about of in the planet regime, we don't see that. So okay. in a way, it's like us. When you are living on Earth, you don't feel the relativity. You don't feel the Earth is, is, is a sphere. You, you believe it's flat, and it's not. Yeah. It's good enough to live. You don't need to know that Earth is a sphere to live. Yeah, yeah. Um, you only need to know it if you start sailing around, around the Earth. So, so um, you don't see it. It's there, but it's a, such a small scale that it's not visible. Yeah, and uh, so your your when when you do your experiments, you are not affected by the uh, black holes and the uh, the dark mass and dark energy. And I. I I think only 5% of the mass in the universe is our kind of touchable mass. No? And like 95% is well, this dark energy and dark, uh, dark mass and dark energy, but still you, 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 it doesn't affect your, your measurements. Yeah, uh, the, because that's what I said. I mean, most yeah, yeah. The, you need to be baryonic to be visible, yes. uh, to just produce something that you can detect. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then it's only a fraction. Uh, and there, there, is, there is zillions of neutrinos, which is crossing your body right now. Yes, and uh, yes. at these neutrinos, you don't see them, doesn't, doesn't have any taste, doesn't change your meal. Yeah, they you don't see it because you don't interact. Yeah, so yeah. so the, 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 the concept of matter, the concept of what it is, is only related to interactions. Yeah, yeah, of course. So if you don't interact with that, you don't see it. So, yeah, yeah. so it doesn't matter that you have 95% of the universe, which is not very well known what it is about. It's yeah, just yeah. annoying for physicists not to know, but it doesn't yeah, yeah. matter to, uh, to, uh, to produce uh, the understanding at the scale we, we are working on. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, and the standing world, predict the origin or the destiny of the universe. You have to understand that because then it matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And you, so, yeah. 
like you talked about how all this is kind of custom instruments and custom code. Uh, and that yes, the connection is active. Last time we never had problems, today we have lots of problems. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you very well. Uh, uh, I, it's on your side. It, it, you look frozen here. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, Hello? Um, yeah. So you, you talked about how all this was kind of custom instruments and custom. Oh, really? Gold, and I've okay. like, um, particularly with friends who are physicists, I get the sense that uh, a lot of the time, like, someone will write some code or make an instrument for what they need for their paper um but there's not really like if someone then wants to build on it you know at the best maybe they can dig something out of their paper but there's not really a sort of what we do on the industrial side of sort of try and make sure that everything's where someone can reuse it and as um like as all of that gets more complicated um do you see, like, it seems like there's a bit of a gap between the very experimental stuff and the very industrial stuff where sort of what, um, you know, uh, like in between something that's fully mass produced and something that's completely custom, every... every okay. So you're asking actually... Hmm? Okay, so the question you're asking is in a way, what... Well, it's a connection between fundamental science or blue sky research developments and uh, productions or, or society or the applicability of it. Okay, uh, that's, that's a very good question. So my, my answer... I mean, I mean more about the sort of the practicalities of, uh, of the instruments you're using and the techniques you're um, applying them. Uh, you know, just to let to get science done rather than Rather than the applicability. Sorry. Uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that, but I think what it's it's the whole process of the fundamental interesting for applicability here. Um, okay, maybe I can continue. Uh, so the what the the what is what matters is when you do something which is let's say curiosity driven you have no limits uh, except that your own curiosity so the curiosity driven initiative is applicable to all the stage of your research it goes from the idea to the development of new software new hardware and then to looking for something new mm -hmm. all this have an impact you can come up along the way because you are completely creatively driven to develop a new kind of software that mm -hmm. later on will have some application <clears throat> somewhere to the society. Or you can come up into a new hardware that similarly may have later on an application. Or you can discover a new phenomena that later on can have an application to the society. So it's the whole process of the curiosity-driven research, which is interesting. So the only thing that matters here is whatever is being done has to be uh, communicated. So, so that's why in the science, it's so critical to produce uh, publications, to communicate. And that's why there is a push mm -hmm. from all the agencies to do that in an open manner <laughs> where you don't have to have this publication to be accessed by a paywall or some limited publication. It has to go in a kind of a free-floating open source way. So anything we're doing, we put that in, the, on a, on a, in the open. And, and what is the exact application from the society? In a way, it's not up to us, but it's up to the society to grasp what they believe is useful. And if you look around the way we're living, anything we're using from or cell phone, car, house, the way we just fly. It is entirely, all the development has been made in the lab, in the research lab hmm. at the beginning. Some... Um. 
something had come up the world of the absolute necessity for society and for its future to maintain a steady curiosity driven research because this is the feeding stock for people that are really deploying some of the applications into the real world and at the end are making for example a cell phone or new medicines or something which has a direct impact on our day-to-day -day life no so i cannot tell you exactly what is useful but i can tell you that anything we do we put it in the open so if somebody is willing to replicate and use some of the stuff we have been using they will and i have heard that some of the principle of this new development has been used uh, uh, for industrial um, productions. Uh, mm. They are, people have used the same kind of design, optical design, mm. and they use it to do a uh, reconnaissance of materials. Uh, I mean, flowing on kind of a, a, a very fast, and they just identify what it is very quick, and they need to do some spectroscopy to do that. And, uh, and, and this is one of the use of the optical development on, on specific industrial product. Uh, maybe for if you want to do triage of your of your garbage, this is something that you could use. <laughs> so uh, if you want to do spectroscopy of your garbages, you will tell you what it is. So you can do a lot of uh, <laughs> if you have to do very quick and to decide where it goes. Uh, that's what one of the possible application. <laughs> But I think there are, I mean, there are many unexpected outcomes from research, like, for example, World Wide Web from the uh, sun in Geneva. Uh, you know, the World Wide Web. I mean, the it, everything is unexpected. Yeah. yeah, everything. And that I keep saying to everybody, the world we live in has been developed in labs by researchers who can do the world. We're just curious and they develop it something. It's <coughs> curiosity driven. And, and, and that's the way it works. So anything we're doing, anything we're touching has been made somewhere by a creative mind in a lab. I think the idea or the key development that then allow the developments, the real developments of yes. the, uh, the tools I mean, you using kind of dialogue. Uh, of this is why there's something very important behind mm -hmm. is this is why we need a steady flow of funding mm. for fundamental research is very very bad to go up mm. and down in fundamental research because fundamental research has no timeline mm -hmm. it's just the objective is to get the best people mm -hmm. free mind searching mm -hmm. and and helping the society to improve and to survive and mm -hmm. if you if you mm -hmm. stop if you're decreasing the amount of fundings or if you do a up and down in the fundings it is at the end a catastrophe and there is country that are well understood that right now mm -hmm. there is some country that are doing bad one of them is us it's very understood the amount of money they need to put in i think they're not generous into research but there's one country which is doing very good is china china is putting tons of money right now into the research yes yes but so I think we can process. predict that the two to fifty years will be absolutely world leading in terms of research. Mm -hmm. if, if the other country are not doing it, mm -hmm. I don't know Japan, in, but I know Japan is very good about yeah, research. Japan is investing so a lot of Nobel laureates from not Japan. Good. Today the connection is terrible. I don't know. Last time the connection was always very good. I'm, I'm so sorry. The connection, internet connection, is so bad today. The last times it was so much better. I don't know why that is. But yeah, I think it's because yeah, I think it's because of the uh, because if there was the U.S. elections and everybody is crazy on the web, that's uh, maybe why. I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about the research funding, huh? and you mentioned that the funding in, in China is, is very excellent. And you asked about uh, Japan, and I think in, in Japan the, f the funding is quite high, but the organization is not so good. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think Switzerland and UK has a 
much better research organization. So it's more, the, the funding is used more efficiently, I think, in Switzerland and in, in, in the UK. That's my impression. Uh, you mentioned also the applications and, uh, for example, you are using CCD detectors a lot and I was doing Raman scattering and the CCD detectors are the same. And so CCD detectors is another application, I think, which comes out of this research which, are doing, which you are doing. I mean, the CCD detectors are not directly your, your research topic, but uh, your work drives the development of CCD, uh, CCD detectors and image detection and uh, uh, error correction and these type of technologies as well. Don't you think so? Um, yes, um, the, uh, the, the astronomers are always looking for what's called zero noise detector. Yes, which exactly. is a kind of a different edge from the military need, which is yes, yes, yes. sensitive. They are very noisy, but they need sensitive. We are yes, more yes. interested about zero noise. Yes. And, and there has been new developments of this zero noise detector yes. have application. But the most interesting application of astronomy is the development of microscopic optics yes. and integrated optics. Yes. Because there is a lot of developments of this integrated optics, microscopic optics, and corrective optics that yes. done on the mirror yes. for eye surgery. So a lot of the work in eye surgery has been made possible because of the development made in astronomy in the 70s uh, okay. about the early correction of the know. telescopes. So it's interesting to see there's a dialogue into science. Yes, 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 yes. Because an eye, an eye is like is like the atmosphere it keeps it keeps changing so if you want to do surgery in the back of the eye you need to estimate the change of the ray of oh. laser oh. to the eyes you don't want to beam a laser at the wrong location you want to be right so you have to correct of the path and oh. that's exactly what we're doing in astronomy we corrected the path of the light when it's crossing the atmosphere oh, okay I didn't know about this connection between astronomy and 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 I, uh, uh, you know, I search. I didn't know at all. Um, yeah, I, I when I was doing Raman scattering measurements, you know, optical measurements, we always had this connection to astronomy with the CCD detectors, with image detectors, the multi-channel detectors. Yeah. And do you think there's life somewhere else on, on other planets? Uh, just from your intuition. This, well, you know, well, my, my, my always, my reaction to that is very simple. I mean, life is just chemistry. There's no magic. It's a chemistry. So it's a chemistry event. No, what is really interesting is to look at what is the ingredients of this chemistry. What okay. do you need for this chemistry okay. to happen? So, so I, my understanding is not too difficult okay. to have at least the prebiotic. So the, the, the first principal element being built like the amino acids. Yeah, what yeah. is maybe more difficult is how do you move from this to the building blocks to really a working organism? And it's possible that you need some kind of breakthrough, some step, some piece of lock here and yeah. that happen at the right time to make it work. But the principle is as soon as you have something working, you start to overwhelm the other. So as soon as one has a, some, some, a little bit of an asset, something better, yes, you will yes. get it all. So if yeah. you have feedstock somewhere, yes, yes. and uh, feedstock being just chemistry element around, yes. and one of the developments just by luck is able to grab better the feedstock, it will grow and any will develop some kind of bit more alive. So I think this kind of aliveness yes. must have happened a bit everywhere. Okay. Now, what is not clear is how do you end up from aliveness, having some kind of working chemistry that look alive uh -huh. into uh, animals? Okay. Because then you need maybe some very specific event, maybe a falling uh, a delivery, specific delivery or specific yeah. conditions. Uh, or likely it is, I don't know. But look, there is billions and billions of stars and yes. there is billions and billions of planets. Well, I think when you have a lot of lottery ticket uh, to take, uh -huh. you must be really unlucky to not have some that manage to get life. Yes. So I do believe that life is something that has to come a bit everywhere. 
but may not be able to develop or maybe just disappear or maybe will start and reach a level like us when we are so crazy and so dangerous that you're going to kill yourself. Yeah. We had a similar discussion with Lord Martin Rees, you know, some weeks ago, and he, uh, we also discussed oh, yeah. <laughs> life on other planets, and he had these ideas, you know, that there could be life which is much more advanced than ours, you know, like we always, we think that our human state of development is kind of the furthest you can go, but uh, he thinks that, uh, you know, in his thinking, our life is uh, only a relatively short, you know? And if you have uh, other planets, for example, where life has developed much, much further than our life, you know, you could have uh, uh, forms of life which we can't, you know, imagine yet because we haven't seen it yet because it's more advanced, you know? This, it, this is going- yeah, There's two concepts which is interesting know. behind this. I know very well, yeah, I know very well Martin and the work he's doing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there's two concepts. First, the concept of advance. So uh, I, it, what do you define as advance? So uh, usually what is in the mind, an advance is when you reach the level to uh, travel through space. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That's how you measure it. Because yes. otherwise, I don't see why a dolphin would be less advanced than us or, yes, or yes. rabbit or anything else. What does it mean? I mean, advance, what does it mean? So, yeah. so, so in, in a sense here, um, the most advanced species uh, on Earth is the one that really is dominating the Earth, yes, yes. which are essentially microorganisms. The yes. microorganisms, and they are very well advanced, and there is a one, I don't know if it's alive or not, which is managing to be everywhere. It's a virus. We're talking a lot about the virus right yes, now, yes. but this is, to me, the most advanced organism on Earth, because this one are going to survive whatever happens. Yes, yes. yes. They will be there. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I think in terms of species, um, I think we, uh, we are not in a good shape um, because we are reaching a stage right now, we're definitely terraforming the earth. So we're changing completely the, the structure of the surface of the earth and the atmosphere. And, and even more worrisome, uh, we have the capability and the tool to destroy ourselves. I mean, the next big event on earth is not a falling meteorite. The, yes, the yes. next big event on earth is somebody which is igniting all the nuclear weapon we have. This is just crazy to have all this weaponry on Earth. Yes, yes. We are very dangerous people and yes. we are dangerous species. Yes. And I think we are the, the bigger threat for the life on Earth, it's yes. us. And, uh, and I'm not super optimistic here because when I see what I see, um, I'm not sure that we're learning very much. So I think we have a serious problem here in terms of governance, in terms of the way we're living. I think we cannot keep living with the threat of all this nuclear weapon on the head. I think this is just absolutely madness. I'm not even talking about global warming, which is going to produce mass migration of people because we will have flooded some region of Earth. Yes, yes. And uh, I think we are we are at a tipping point of a civilization because we're traveling into space, but yes. at the same time we have this capability since about uh, 50 years, 50, 60 years. Um, to uh, destroy yourself entirely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I don't want to seem pessimistic, but uh, I understand and all this debate that Martin Rees is putting together about the risk uh, in yes, terms yes. of civilization. I think this yes, is yes. very serious. Yeah. I wish we could do something about this, but... <laughs> I think we all could do something. We all could do something. I think I think we have to make sure people are the most educated possible. Understand. That certainly helps a lot. And we have to make sure people understand what's going on. I think there is nothing worse than people that does not understand, that doesn't know, and that doesn't want to know. So of course, some people will never want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think the education, the high level of education is the key. We cannot run a democracy without a very high level of education. And that's, I think, the big challenges of the democracy we have right yeah. now is we expect everybody to behave in a democratic way, but yeah. we don't give the chance to everyone to be educated the same way. Yeah. And that's absolutely dramatic, the yeah, situations. Yeah. And this has to be fixed sooner or later. But uh, how, uh, what would your suggestions be to, to improve this situation? 
Well, I think we should first recognize uh, how education is critical. And uh, I think we should have really the opportunity to offer as much education as possible mm -hmm. uh, to everyone. That's really, I think, the first goal. This would be a really a massive goal. We talk, we talk about, we solve in a way some of the big diseases on earth. We kind of solve the problem of feeding everybody in a way. You know, it's time to make sure everybody is educated. That's, I think, the third big challenge is right now. So science is part of this education. It's not the only one, but we have to make sure uh -huh. science is well understood. It should not be accept the finding of the science. And, and when you see other reactions that against rational thinkings, I think it's very scary. And that's certainly due to possibly a kind of a deficit of education uh, on a global scale on Earth. And I think this is where we should work. And, yeah. and this is where I'm trying to do my little bit and everybody, every us should do that because we all have the possibility to yeah. change something at yeah. the values level we have at any level. And I think we should uh, try to get a bit more involved. Uh, we, we, we're asking too much about the academia and the, and the education systems. I think the industry has to play a role. I think the business yeah. society has to play a role. Yeah. I don't see why industry and business should not be part of this education role. I don't think right now they defer it. They yeah. they pay tax and they say, we pay tax, we don't care. We just yeah, have yeah. the people doing it. I think it's a mistake. They should be part of the game. They should yeah. be part of the game. And there is too much antagonism uh, between economy, education, and, and, and helping the people. I think all this should be much more smooth and going together. <laughs> we have only one earth. We're all on the same earth. And we hope have a limited number of time on this earth as yeah. an organism. And uh, let's try to make a good use of it. It's limited. I mean, uh, and sooner or later, nobody will remember what we'll be doing. Think about 500 years ago, anybody having, doing something extraordinary, more, having a business on doing something. What is, if you direct what you're doing to the future generations, that's the only way to do it. And one way to do that is education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, education. Yeah, educate. I mean, education is the uh, the core problem for every country, no? But there are many. It's a many layered issue, no? Because uh, well, I think look. Uh, well, it, it it it's a very many layered issue because. Uh, Other country, look in Europe, it's not going up, it's going down. Look in UK, it's not going up, it's going down. Look in US, it's going down. So, so they are really a problem in the amount of money which is feeding education at a various level. And that is very big threat, I think, for the democracy. And this is not fully understood, I think, it's, yeah, or at least acknowledged. In, in Japan, for example, in Switzerland, where you are, you know, education is essentially free, uh, including university. But in Japan, you have to pay from the age of 15. And there are some rich countries where uh, access to education is, is hard, even rich countries like Japan, for example. No? So it's the, the uh, 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 how do you say that? Uh, importance of education is seen differently in different countries. And in, in some countries it's seen as, as uh, you know, part of the competitive, uh, like in England, you have to take loans in order to pay. No? And it, it becomes very political also. I mean, in US- Well, I think any system can work if the system is part of the grand scheme. The point I'm making is not the detail of the system. It's not the fact it's free or not free because there is a mechanism in a way to get funded yeah. education in England, even if you have to pay. So yeah. what is matter here is how much the community, whatever you call it, I don't want to call it the government, I call it the community. It's yeah, even yeah, yeah. bigger than the, only the government is willing to put money into education at um, various level. Okay. It can go to the subunit of the family, it yes. can go to the local level, it can go to the government level, yes. it can go to the more global scale level, the community level. I think this is a common community problem. You okay. have to spend more money. 
into education to allow everyone to be educated properly. And I think this is the best you can do for the society, the best yeah. ever you can do for the society. Yeah. But then I think mm. like uh, institutions like the Nobel Prize, for example, they are like a polar star to aim for. So uh, like your work is also an inspiration for everybody to, uh, you know, to aim high. <laughs> so that's a stimulation. Yeah, for but the Nobel Prize has a, yeah, the Nobel Prize has a lot of programs trying to uh, uh, stimulate education. So again, Nobel Prize is a kind of a flag. It's a flagship. Yes and, uh, yes, yes, and I think you don't need to the Nobel Prize to be a very su successful scientist because there's a lot of great science being done, of, and just yes. by the randomness of the process, I mean, only very few get it. But yes, it doesn't yes. matter. I think yes, we, we just we we just use as a flagship here, and uh, and 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 if if we can inspire people, if this flagship can be good because we can help other people to do something that uh, to try to achieve dreams. To stimulate the developments of education, that's it. I think we play a role. There's nothing else than this. So I really hope that, in a way, I will be able to use this platform to help and to stimulate. Yes. And uh, I will have be more. My voice will just go farther out. We have a bit more loud. Uh, yes. Sir. Maybe some government will listen to me. I'm not that sure, but let's hope. <laughs> And and and, uh, and 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 that will be good because that's a bit the way. So in a way, the system helps, and that is a good start for Nobel Prize. You know, the Nobel Prize there is something extremely elevated in the principle, and I never realized this until I really dig out into the history of the Nobel Prize. Uh -huh. Nobel Prize started about at the same time as the Red Cross in the end of the 19th century, uh -huh. and they are in a way built on a similar vision, uh -huh. which is. There is no state, uh -huh. everybody is the same. So okay. the Red Cross is based on principle. You have to help people, whatever country they are from and whatever race or color of skin or whatever uh -huh. they are. Uh -huh. The Nobel Prize is built on the same principle. At that time, that was an heretic statement, absolutely heretic. People were against this. And really? it was I just 20 years before, yes, because it was 20 years, I remind you, before the first crazy conflict the first world war that was based on the principle of nation yes so yes. nobel said i don't want to hear about this yes. and he created so much antagonism that the king of sweden at that time uh -huh. boycotted the really? first uh, yes because he could not understand how you could not do a price for the nordic countries only why would you be to be international? So the concept of transnational. Oh, that is, was no, right. it's common. Yeah, yeah, that that of NGOs, organizations everywhere, and uh, yeah, United yeah. Nations, all this. Yeah. Everybody understand that right now. Okay. But at the end of the 19th century, that yes. was absolutely erratic. No, so this is the beauty of the price because okay. it emphasis, like the Red Cross, I think, uh -huh. they both emphasize a fundamental principle mm. is nations are built on nonsense the yeah. notions is just a concept that has no ground whatsoever mm -hmm. it's a ridiculous concept that yeah. has no foundations doesn't mean anything because we are a species we are all the same yes so the fact we have organizations is just a, 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 a completely artificial organizations yes, yes which may be practical from practical reason because of languages and some aspect and to control the migrations mm -hmm. fine if you want to see it like that mm -hmm. but there is higher stake, mm -hmm. which is when you want to have the best brain mm -hmm. and when you have talk about survival, mm -hmm. like for the global warming right now, uh -huh. nations should vanish, should vanish uh -huh. because there is higher elevated yes. uh, uh, element to consider. And Nobel Prize was the first one uh -huh. to start this concept uh -huh. for science. That's oh. why the prize is so famous, because that was the first one and I was the first to tell science is universal. Uh -huh. Science is about people talking together, interacting uh -huh. between each other. Uh -huh. It is not related to your country of origin. Uh -huh. and, and that's the beauty of the prize. So when you get a Nobel Prize, you have to really promote this concept. I think it's part okay. of the game. I didn't know this. I, I didn't know. That's a beautiful this. story. And you know why you thought that way? Because Nobel, uh, I think, spoke six, six languages. And he spent his time in Russia, in Sweden, 
yeah, um, in, uh, in, in France, in Italy, uh, in Germany. So he had yeah. all these languages he could speak. So yeah, yeah. yeah, he was entrepreneur and he, he had companies in many countries. And, and he was speaking was, all the languages and it, it was this kind of universal mind. Yeah. So I didn't know about this global revolutionary aspect. That, that's yeah. very, very interesting. Um, well, I don't want to take, we shouldn't take too much of your time. I'm sure you have some more planets to discover. <laughs> That's okay. It's always good to take with my friends of Trinity. I'm hoping to go to Japan so, sooner or later. So there's a big meeting, I think. In oh, 20, if you come, please. I'll let us. you know. In uh, 22, please. I think there is a big meeting in Kyoto. So I'll let you uh, know. Please tell us and we can organize here another yeah. meeting for you. With uh, pleasure. And, I'm very sorry today. I don't know why, but the internet connection was not very good. So uh, in a way, our conversation was sometimes a bit uh, slowed down. Uh, one thing is if somebody has questions here, do you have a little bit more time if somebody has questions here? Yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. I still 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Is that okay? You had a question. Uh, yeah, oh, yes, yeah. Uh, just... Uh... Uh, it's Professor I, Fukumoto from Kyushu. He came specially about thousand kilometers to here. <laughs> oh, wow. Here. I feel very honored. Thank you <laughs> very much. You, you only thought uh, solar system uh, is not uh, uh, common, uh, maybe exception. But uh, uh, there is a famous uh, law on the location of the uh, planets, Bo Bode, Bode law. And uh, is this I wonder that this happened uh, by accident in our solar system, or are there uh, some similar uh, law to the planet outside solar system? Yeah. Okay. So it's a very interesting question. So, so first, I can I can say simply, the board law is not a law. It's not universal. Uh -huh. No. What happened is, if you look into the detail, there is something interesting here. The first. The Bode law is a logarithmic law, essentially. So any logarithmic law means there is something which is related to the power. So there must be a power somewhere to the distance. Now, there is a couple of principles that you can look, which is the dynamical stability into the systems. You can define around each of the planet, what is the minimum distance you need to be the next planet to be for the system to be stable because if two planets are getting too close you can end up with dynamical interactions mm -hmm. and at the end you can destroy completely the system so you find out that the solar system is in the stable conditions but it is the minimum stable condition so the fact the planet are where they are is right they cannot be closer uh -huh. If they would be closer, they would start still destroying themselves. Wow. So that's very interesting because it tells you that behind the bold law, there is this concept of stability. Stop. And no, you can do exactly the same mm -hmm. for other planetary systems. And you will find they have also a logarithmic law. And it's not the same law, but it's also logarithmic. Mm -hmm. It's not the same power, mm -hmm. uh, but you also have this this kind of a very uh, um, uh, organized structure. Yeah. So the fact the structure is organized is in a way a consequences of the fact that the system is stable. Because mm -hmm. for the system to be stable, you need to be in a minimum compact position. Okay. And this minimum compact position is given by the dynamic of the planet. Mm -hmm. And it means there is a relation. So there is many board law, there is one for the solar systems, there is one for every system, but it, it is not exactly the same, but is still a similar logarithmic law. So that is what is behind the board law. It's very interesting. Yes. Interesting. Thank you for the question. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you. We also, we have here Mrs. Suzuki. She's the head of the uh, uh, science section of the Swiss embassy. I oh, asked the Swiss okay. ambassador, but he was busy. So do you have a, do you want to come here? And, well, or maybe we can. Uh, uh, wait, if you come over here. Uh, so she is here in, uh, to represent the Swiss embassy. I feel honored. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to everyone. And uh, I would just like to add that if you to follow up on your comments that when you come to Japan next time, we would be honored to host you at the embassy. Okay. Where is the embassy? Is in is in um, uh, where are you? Where in which city are, is the embassy? Kyoto. Okay. It makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I will definitely uh, let you know. Yes, with the, with your. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. That that sure. I mean, if I go to Japan, it's a long it's a long trip. So I will stay long enough to have some time to meet colleagues. I have a couple of colleagues are working, I know, in Japan, and uh, and I really have to spend some time. So I will definitely uh, go to Tokyo and go to Kyoto. I think this is the two places, definitely, I would go. Thank you very much. OK. If uh, anybody more questions? So thank you so very, very much. And I'm very sorry for the a bad connection. No, that was good. That was good for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon and stay healthy and best wishes to your family. Um, you too. You too. And uh, have a good dinner then. Uh, yes, we'll have dinner now in your honor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye bye. <laughs>